Right now, we're going to make way for Sean Assam. Sean, are you there with me, buddy? Sean's going to talk to us a little bit about the Aquapilot salt systems, and that's where we're going to wrap it up today. And we'll learn a little bit more about salt systems and potentially okay. a go-to, potentially one of our go-tos as we look at this chlorine tablet debacle that we're heading into. So there you are. Take it away, buddy. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I know it's been a long day for you too, Rudy. So we'll end this day together. Um, hold on a second. I'm trying to get my screen going here. Yeah, I don't know what I did. All right. Well, I'm gonna. You gonna ring it? I'm gonna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what. Here we go. This should be the right button. All right. Uh, I'm gonna share share my screen. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about uh, Aquacal and autopilot salt chlorine generator systems. Um, we know that there are a couple of things that's taken place in the industry regarding you know, shortage, shortages and supplies and demands for our products. Now, based on, let me pull up my presentation. All right, so uh, Aquacal Autopilot, we are a manufacturer of the Autopilot salt fluorine generation system. Um, I want to get into why there's such a demand for chlorine generators. But I, I want to answer something that uh, you addressed with um, with Steve previously as far as um, supply and demand. How do we get it? What's the lead times? Uh, I did the presentation earlier in regards to the Aquacal heat pumps. And I can tell you with our heat pumps, because the demand has increased so greatly um, that we're falling behind in, in quantities that we can produce on a month to month basis. Um, our heat pumps are currently about a 10 week lead time. So anyone who's looking for heat pumps, we do have some uh, pool corp locations, um, some Florida water products locations outside of Florida that are carrying our inventory. But again, if you need our heat pumps, you need to let them know that they, got, they have to order more to bring it in so that it's ready for you. Um, with the salt chlorine generators, with the other pilot systems, um, those are more of a, a dealer direct. We do have a more readily available products on the salt chlorine generator side. Um, the worst case scenario with the lead times with our uh, autopilot nanos and nano pluses, we're about three week lead times there. Any of our commercial products were about a one to two week lead time. And our newest product, which is our chlorsync, um, is readily available. But let me get into uh, the salt chlorination process. Um, what exactly a salt chlorine generator is? How does it work? And why is it a viable option uh, in today's uh, market, especially with what we're seeing? A salt chlorine generation system, well, the natural process, because it's a salt chlorine generator, we're making chlorine out of salt. The first ingredient is putting salt into the pool. Uh, most manufacturers will want about 2,500 to 3,500 parts per million of salt. Uh, once it goes into the water, it dissolves, it stays dissolved. So what happens is that brine solution will go through your circulation system, through the pump, through the filter. When it gets to the cell, in this case with the autopilot manifold, we're actually uh, splitting up the flow and slowing down the water that's going through the cell so that we have more contact time with the water that's passing through. That way we can treat it much more efficiently and much more effectively before it goes back to the pool. So what, it, what takes place is you've got 100% pure chlorine that's going back into the pool. Um, the, one of the main reasons why we, we slow down the flow going through the cell is because the longer contact time we have, the better we can treat the water, especially if it's, it's water that's being used and the result is you've got chloramines in the water itself. Um, that longer contact time tends to give us a little bit more benefit to treat that water of the chloramines. All right. So again, because we're putting salt in the water, we're also seeing that because there's more salt chlorine generators being sold, there's a lot of salt that's being sold also. So there may be some shortages of the salt, whether it's branded 
pool salt or if it's, uh, you know, the, the granular salt, um, what I can suggest is that pretty much if you've got a 99.7% minimum purity of salt, um, that's going to work fine. Pool salt is best because it dissolves real quickly, but granular salt, um, salt pellets or salt flakes are okay as well. Um, if you go to in a pinch, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and get your water softener salt, the only difference is that it takes a little longer to dissolve, but it is a very high purity salt. Um, the ones that you want to avoid is any of the salt that would have any kind of like a resin or an anti-rust type of additive to it, because what that does is introducing impurities into the water that we're not sure what it is that has the potential to cause staining. Now, a lot of the granular type salts also, what you'll find is that I see people saying, avoid the salt that has the YPS, yellow prussiate of soda. When you look at the ingredients of YPS, there's a very minimum um, quantity of iron that's contained in it, but the YPS is the anti-caking agent for the granular salt. As long as you add the salt and you dissolve it quickly, you've got very little staining potential, even with those types of salt. So and my recommendation is turn your pool on, circulate the pump, turn the main drain on. If there's a main drain, dump all your salt towards the deep end of the pool, and you'll find about 50 to 60 percent of the salt dissolves before it hits the bottom. The warmer the water, the more quicker it dissolves. Um, the rest of the salt that's not dissolved yet, brush into the main drain as it circulates through, it's going to dissolve much more rapidly. Hey, Sean, let me ask. I mean, we, we use the word shortage a lot for a lot of different things. And I know we, we say that there's a salt shortage because of this increased demand, but it's not similar to what we're seeing with tablets. It's not like we're in danger of running out of salt. What's going to, I mean, correct, correct me if I'm wrong. It's just that right now there's going to be an unprecedented demand. No way to predict right. it because we don't know what's coming because of the tablets. So right. it's really more of a hiccup in logistics. Wouldn't you agree? I absolutely agree. Now so you guys don't need to also. panic about you know not not you know after the tablet shortage here comes the salt shortage. It's just right. going to take longer to get it. It is coming, right? Right. right. And okay. you got to you got to you know if you if you think about it um, with the freezing temperatures that we've had, a lot of people are using salt towards the road salts and de-icing kind of stuff too. So a lot of those resources went into that um, industry rather than being able to bag up the aqua salt um, to use for swimming pools. But like I said, if you're caught in a bind, you can go to a Home Depot and get a water softer type salt um, to add to the pools, all right? And that's basically what I want to touch on is that if distribution doesn't have enough in stock and you need to start up a system, you can always use those alternative sources of salt. All right. Um, when to add, now we know National Plasters Council will always say add 28 days minimum um, before you put in, anything into the pool so that the plaster has a chance to, to cure and to set in. Um, once you've got a cured pool or if you've got an existing pool that you don't have to worry about that or fiberglass pool, vine liner pool, you can add it immediately. And specifically with the autopilot salt systems, you can energize a cell right away. And the reason why you can do that is because with our system, there is no high salt limit so that it does not impact our power supply, our cell, or the operation of the system. Um, how, how do you lose salt? Now, one of the things that we look at is that in the chlorine generation process, we're using chlorine to generate chlorine, uh, we're using salt to generate chlorine, but we're not losing up we're not losing salt in the process. We're not using up the salt in the process to generate the chlorine, right? So basically from backwashing your filters, um, drag out from your bathing, spoot, bathing suits, um, jump in the water, splash outs and leaks are the ways that you're gonna lose salt. So in a theoretical world, if there were no leaks in the pool and you weren't losing any water, that salt that goes into the water, 3000 parts per million is where most manufacturers want it, will continue to stay at 3,000 parts per million, okay? Um, so those are the ways that you lose the salt, not from evapor evaporation, because we hear a lot of people also say that, you know, when you're losing water because it's hot and the water evaporates, you're losing salt also, not so. The salt actually stays in the water and increases in concentration if you're losing water from evaporation. So then when you add water to make it back up, then it comes back to the 3,000 parts per million. Um, what concentration is needed, like I mentioned before, most manufacturers want about 
3,000 parts per million of salt, okay? Now, the way that you determine 3,000 parts per million, there are several uh, salt test strips, salt test skits, um, electronic meters to help determine what it is. A lot of times on the salt chlorine generator system, it will show you a salt level also, but uh, in some cases there are dedicated salt sensors. In other cases, it's using the condition of the cell to estimate what the salt level is. So just be careful if you ever get a situation where it says low salt, it's always best to test it first to see where you're at um, before you start adding a bunch of salt into the pool. Typically below 2000 part per million will shut off the system because at that point, your salt level is too low, all right? So it doesn't impact the, um, the power supply operating and it impacts the life of the cell. Now, when you're talking about salt levels in part per million, a lot of times we don't have a concept of what exactly is 3000 part per million. Um, the human taste level, when you start to get about 3,500, that's when you can tell that it's kind of salty. You can taste the salt in the water. Contact lens saline solution is around 6,000 part per million. The human body or the tears is around 9,000 part per million. But the, the misconception is that, wow, they're putting a lot of salt into my pool. It's going to taste like seawater. Absolutely not. Again, we're, we're maintaining about 3,000 part per million. So it's nowhere near the 35,000 of, of seawater. Um, one of the comments we hear is that the water feels better. Absolutely, it feels better. There's a couple of reasons why. We know that water tends to find its own balance. So if we jump in a wall, if we, if we have a pool, right, a plaster pool, and there's very low calcium, typically what will happen is that water is trying to find its own balance. It's going to draw the calcium out of the plaster. So then the same effect, if we jump in a pool and there's no salt in the pool, it's going to try to find a balance in that salt level. Guess where it's going to draw it from? From our bodies. So that's when you get out of the pool, your skin feels dry. One of the reasons why is because there's no salt in the water. So by adding salt into the pool, it becomes closer matched to what our body is. And that's where you get this hypotonic effect of the soft, silky water. All right. So that's one of the other, one of the reasons. Now, another thing that we hear with salt in the, in the pool is that it's corrosive. Absolutely salt is corrosive at 6,000 parts per million or higher, but not at the 3,000 parts per million that most salt systems uh, recommend to operate under, okay? So at 6,000 parts per million or higher, you will see corrosion to stainless steel in the water. Another reason why is if your pool is not properly bonded, you will see a galvanic action taking place, corrosion taking place in the pool water because of stray voltage getting in and attacking the metals in the pool, such as your handrails, light rings, and ladders, such as that. All right. Bottom line is a salt chlorinator, a salt pool is a chlorine pool. I don't know how many times as pool <laughs> professionals we hear, um, I don't have a chlorine pool. I've got a salt pool. I'm here to tell you as a salt chlorine generator manufacturer, a salt pool is a chlorine pool. Please do not tell the homeowners that they've got a salt pool and not a chlorine pool. This unfortunately is, is one of the hardest things to explain and have people accept. You could break it down chemically, um, show them formulas, all kinds of things. And um, I've spoke a lot about this in the last week. I know you know I have. Mm -hmm. And this has come up every time. And how many times have you heard that portion of this not covered? I mean, seriously, it's, right. it's, it's just omitted. I don't know. But um, <laughs> it's crazy. So Yeah. You know, but, but I think it, it's you, you, it starts off from the homeowner saying, you know, I want something different than chlorine because my kids are allergic, right? And, and you start to think it's like, how many products do we encounter every day that has chlorine in it? You're drinking water, it's going to have chlorine in it, in it right? Oh, this so, is where the, the bubble comes in. They have to live in a bubble. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But and the bottom line is a salt bubble. pool is a chlorine pool. All right. Um, so some of the benefits of chlorine generation with a salt system, though, is breakpoint chlorination levels. Like I said, when we're slowing the water flow going through the cell, um, within the cell body itself, we're hitting breakpoint chlorination where it's generating chlorine. It's going to oxidize the contaminants and it's going to eliminate chloramines in most cases. If your bather load is much heavier than the capability of the cell to get rid of those chloramines, you're going to see a buildup of, of the chloramines in the water. But for the most part, we're going to be able to control those conditions that give you the, the strong chlorine smell from the chloramines and, you know, the burning red eyes and, you know, those type of 
conditions that we typically see from chloramines. Now, the challenges, and challenges for 2021 and beyond, okay? We started talking about, you know, the shortage of chlorine tablets. Um, and one of the big things is supply and demand. Um, as we heard earlier, people aren't spending their vacation money going on vacations because they can't because of COVID. So they're putting money back into the pool. So what it, what's happening is same thing with our heat pumps. There's a much higher demand um, because there's a, a shorter supply of tablets in the marketplace and chlorine prices are increasing. People are looking for alternatives. Salt chlorine generation is a viable option for your traditional chlorine products. Um, some distributors are finding their supply line becoming more difficult to get products. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that we saw over the hurricane last year was the Biolab factory burning down, which was, you know, 115 million pounds of chlorine per year of trichlor products and dichlor products that was just eliminated. All right. And as far as I know, at this point, there's no plans to rebuild that at this point. So that is basically a resource that's no longer available to the industry. All right, so those are the things that we have to look at. For the service company, there's an overall cost increase because their chlorine levels are going, their chlorine prices are going up, cost of transportation is going up, and just equipment overall is going up. So those are a lot of the, the challenges. There are some people that's getting uh, Chinese tablets coming in. Um, it's viewed as inferior. Now I've seen online also, there's a lot of comments where they're getting pretty good stuff. Great, if you're able to get it, that's, that's perfect to fill in you know, those voids where we're not able to get it uh, domestically. Um, but salt chlorine generation to get back into it being a viable option. Yes, there's an initial investment up front to get the equipment and install it. Um, there is a, a, a definite cell life and there's the replacement cell cost when it comes time to replace the cell. Um, the other issue that we come across is scale formation. And what we hear about is damage to your equipment, your deck in the full finish. I'm gonna cover those issues that we hear about um, day in, day out. Autopilot, and I'm going to talk specifically with Autopilot, we've got a wide breadth of products which are both residential, uh, commercial, and as you can see in the middle and the bottom, um, systems that include uh, ozone generation. So we have systems that are just a chlorine generator only, um, incorporating with ozone, and then the bottom right side, um, a total automation, which is basically ORP and pH control with the acid introduction. Our basic bottom of the line system or our good, better, best, our good unit is our Eco Nano, which is our um, cheapest system out there. It does not use what we call our tri sensor, which gives us a lot more advantages um, over other salt systems. It just uses a plain flow switch, a uh, power supply, and a cell. It's a very price competitive unit and it does generate chlorine. Um, on, the, on the display itself, it's gonna give you a two char character display to let you know if there are any uh, warning conditions, if there are any error messages, um, you can control the percentage uh, by way of that uh, display also. No manifold, so we've got a 20 to 100 gallons per minute flow range going through there. And naturally, if you're seat exceeding 100 gallons a minute, we re recommend doing a bypass assembly. Um, on here, it says no tri-sensor, and I'll describe what the tri-sensor does in a minute when I get into a couple of slides. It's a flow switch only to determine there's proper flow going through there. Now, getting onto our other models that's not the Eco Nano, all of our other models include what we have as a patented manifold assembly. Now the manifold assembly, like you described in the diagram at the beginning, um, controls the flow that's going through the cell by slowing it down. You can see there's a couple of components in our manifold on the bottom. There's a spring check valve that regulates how much flow goes to the top. Um, the bottom union on the left-hand side is a uh, strainer screen that catches any kind of debris before it gets up to the cell. At the very top of the manifold is our tri-sensor. And the tri-sensor is testing for three things. It's testing for flow, it's testing for water temperature, and it's testing for salt levels. And all three of those things are beneficial because we do something with those. And then on the right-hand side is the conversion cell. That's where all the magic takes place. That's where the chlorine is generated. Now, how are we different? Again, the manifold assembly, the debris screen tri-sensor cell, and the bypass assembly. With this um, manifold assembly, it's a controlled flow going through the cell. It's more efficient, much more effective. Um, when we get to the commercial manifold to the right, 
um, we can see that we can put up to six cells in a single manifold. So six cells in series in a single manifold for larger commercial jobs. It gives you a smaller footprint and it gives you a high chlorine output. On the flow, uh, flow switch, we can do 15 gallons per minute, per minute up to 100 gallons per minute. This is especially um, designed to work very well with variable speed pumps. As you're running lower speeds, the check valve closes and it forces the water flow going up through the top. As you increase your, your the speed of the pump, it opens up more to allow some water to bypass and still regulate the amount of water flow going through the top. All right, so that's our flow switch in the tri sensor. Um, dedicated salt sensor, we do have a dedicated salt sensor inside that tri sensor that's specifically reading what the salt level is about every eight seconds. So it's always giving you a live um, salt calculation in, in the system. Um, we do not have a high salt limit. So for uh, installers who are adding salt and they accidentally put too much salt, our unit does not require you to dilute the water to get it back down. We'll be happy to operate up at seawater levels um, down to 2,500 when you start getting below 2,500. I'm seeing that there and I'm thinking you're saying, you know, if they accidentally add a little bit too much salt and there I see 35,000 parts per million. I keep <laughs> right. thinking to myself, if this was one of my techs back in the day, that person would be looking for a new job at 35,000 parts per million of salt in a pool. But yeah. um, that's, that's insane. I mean, it's good to not have a top yeah. end level. Uh, definitely. Right. We do still have to... Um, take into consideration then the contribution of TDS to LSI and all of those good things. So not just because it can go that high doesn't mean we, we want it to. So right. our ideal level, what's our ideal level here, Sean? You'll find most manufacturers want about 3,000. Okay, and you guys are 2,500 to 3,500? 2,500 to 3,500 would work just fine. Okay. Um, when you go higher, like I said, we don't have a high salt cut. Here's a perfect application. Um, the Ritz-Carlton over in Naples, Florida, They've got a specific pool where they charge res guests to go into their hotel to use this high mineral pool that they keep at 9,000 parts per million because they've got other salts being added into there also. So they okay. charge a premium to be able to use that. Now, 35,000 parts per million, we have our systems with aquatic centers, not an aquatic center, but marine aquarium type centers. So they're bringing in ocean water into the recovery tanks and other um, tanks for dolphins and mm -hmm. whales, otters, stuff like that. Okay. And we're able to sanitize that water using our autopilot system. But in a residential backyard pool, I guess the theory is yeah. just because it can, it doesn't mean we should. Right. Um, but so, I would imagine the pools on the coast, um, I've always found that, you know, and, it, and it's just it's lo perfect logic, pools on the coast have a higher salt water content because they're sitting on the ocean, whether it's right. from their guests jumping into the ocean and jumping into the pool or just even from the wind blowing. Exactly. That's a huge advantage because they typically do meet those top end salt levels very quickly. So, um, right. So down in the islands, we've got some projects down in the islands where the tap water that they have is coming, well, not the tap water, but the source of water that they have to fill their pool comes in at 4,500 parts per million of salt. So we're able to work just fine in those type of conditions. But, um, nice. but you know, like I said, the, the nice thing is that if you accidentally put too much salt, even if you get up to 4,000 or 4,500 with some system, they shut down. Ours will not, will continue operating. Um, the last bullet point there, automatic temperature compensation. Here's one of the features that we have that no one else does, is that we know that when your water temperature increases, there's a higher chlorine demand. Our unit will automatically adjust the output of the system to a higher percentage to create more chlorine. Okay, so we're compensating for water temperature increases by making more chlorine. The other side of it, even more important, is as it gets colder at the beginning of the season, at the end of the season when the water temperature is colder, um, we do an, a uh, temperature compensation where the output automatically drops also, but it never shuts off. Never. Some, some generation systems, when it gets to about 60 degrees water temperature, their unit will shut off for protection. Ours will continue to operate. And the reason why that's nice is because if you're circulating water, you still need chlorine in there, right? So what is the purpose of saying, yeah, I'm sorry, or your system shut down. You're going to have to go buy some chlorine, some tablets or liquid and supplement until water temperature comes up or until you shut down the pool. With our unit, because of the temperature compensation, it will continue operating um, well below 50 degrees 
uh, water temperature. Well, I can tell you that's that's where the whole conversation has come up for me the most as far as I don't have a chlorine pool. I have a saltwater pool. It's just simply, I'm in Florida. It's a year-round season. Of course, I'm right. not in the part of Florida you are in because it actually gets cold here. But um, we do get those cold temperatures, and that is something that we run into. And it's a year-round season, so we're not closing the pool. I'm talking operating, you know, December, January, February. Right. And even though the water temperature is cold, it doesn't mean that it can't, you know, just because the cell doesn't produce chlorine, it doesn't mean that the pool can't grow algae. Exactly. So, or bacteria or all, you know, bacteria goes dormant. It doesn't go away. It can slow mm -hmm. algae growth, but algae can still grow. So here I am, I'm out there supplementing with bleach, right? right. Uh, because I have to have chlorine in there. And that's when the homeowner comes out and says, Rudy, what are you doing? <laughs> Right. It's a what salt do you do to my salt pool? pool. <laughs> I don't use chlorine. And then I have to explain the whole thing to them. And you know what? The reality of it is, is a lot of them still don't believe you. And they right. think that you're doing something horribly wrong and harmful to them. And it's almost malicious. So it right. gets kind of scary. So I, I can see this as being, you know, an advantage just in having to avoid that awkward moment. Exactly. Exactly. All right, so this goes into a little more detail with the tri-sensor unit when you pull it out. That's what it looks like in there. Now, um, it, you've got a salt sensor, temperature sensors, a little white post. Nothing really goes bad with the temperature sensor. Uh, let's see. It's supposed to scroll from here automatically, but that's your salt sensor right there. It's two little metal blades. The only thing I would say with the, with the salt sensor is that if you're not watching your LSI, and your cell gets scaled up quite a bit, there's a tendency for those salt blades to show some scale also. So if you're uh, regularly um, acid washing your cell, it's always a good idea to acid wash the tri-sensor, especially those salt blades as well. Um, this is our flow switch on the left-hand side. It's basically what we call a magnetic flow switch. Now, you want to be careful if you ever uh, if you ever keep any of these on hand so that you can replace them, um, don't toss them around because there's a magnetic flow switch in there that's made uh, with a little glass um, housing. And if they're tossed around, you can break it. All right. So just be careful when you're handling any of the tri sensors. But water flow will come in that direction, hit the flow switch, it comes up to the center, and that tells it when there's sufficient flow. All right. Now the control units on our systems, you can see they all have a display that tells you exactly what's going on. Uh, some of the co common features with all our control system um, is a constant current power supply. So what we're doing is we're setting a fixed current, an amperage going to the cell. What's going to fluctuate is the voltage um, going to the cell also. And that's greatly affected by the salt level, the water temperature, scaled in the cell, and the life of the cell itself. So. Um, we have a, a range that that voltage should be operating under, and when it goes outside of the range, it helps us determine what kind of problems there are. Um, all our power supply has two boost modes. You've got a 24-hour and a 72-hour boost mode. Now, what's different with our boost mode is that it has a memory on it. If your circulation system is running, let's say, um, eight hours a day, in a 24-hour boost mode for the next three days, it will be at 100% output in the boost cycle and it has a countdown timer to let you know how many hours are remaining. If you want to uh, deactivate it, just press the boost button again. The temperature compensation that I talked about, no cold water temperature cutoff and it's adjusting automatically. Uh, salt addition calculation. Um, not only can we operate under the high salt levels, but if you're low on salt, our unit will calculate how much salt is needed to get back to 3,000 part per million. All right, again, that's one of those features that no, no other salt system offers, but it helps with the homeowner uh, if they're maintaining their own system um, as to how much salt is needed to go back into the pool. Um, the other stuff is just, you know, a digital display, check system lights, it gives you the warning messages. Our purifier level is adjustable between 0% to 100% in 1% increments. So you can fine tune it specifically for that particular pool. We've got menus that make us, makes it real easy to walk through and um, diagnose or program. And then we've got the test mode, which is your diagnostic panel. Um, the digital nano and the nano plus seems to be our most popular units right now because we can handle a pretty good sized pool. The nano handles up to 28,000, nano plus handles up to 32,000. 
I do have um, a lead time issue with the digital nano and the nano plus of about three weeks lead time because again, uh, the demand is increasing and we're trying to catch up with the production on these particular models. But as you can see, it's got the manifold assembly. It's basically one set power level at five amps going to the cell. And then, like I said, we can adjust the output to determine how much chlorine you need to generate. When you start getting into larger pools than a 32,000 gallon system, we've got our larger digital DIG220. Um, with this one, we've got three different cell sizes, uh, or I'm sorry, three different cell power levels that we can send uh, to, the, to the cell itself. We've got five different cells that we can actually run with this system, whereas with the Nano, there's only one size. With the Nano Plus, there's only one size cell that we can operate that with. Um, we have adjustable reverse polarity, and this goes back to one of the main complaints we get with chlorine generators is scale cell and high pH. Guess what that is, is part of? LSI, saturation index. So a big part of my training is I talk about balance your water to the saturation index, and you should never have to acid wash your cell because of scale formation, okay? Um, how do we avoid high pH conditions? Oversize the system. We get high pH because the longer the cell is energized, the more it's going to impact your pH. So if you oversize the system, um, the cell doesn't stay on as long, so your pH is not impact is, uh, impacted as much. The DIG220 is also NSF50 for commercial usage. This is perfect for these small little uh, Homewood Suites and uh, Hampton Inn type 15,000 gallon indoor pools. Um, commercial spas, this is a perfect system also. All right. How are we different on our manifold with regards to the digital unit? You can see that we can replace that cell with any of the different five different cells that we have in there because they all fit in the same manifold assembly. Nice. If we need more chlorine, we can put a bigger cell with the digital unit and that'll give us more chlorine. Hey, Sean, one quick question. I know we spoke about the, the pH going up and oversizing the cell as a solution. The pH yeah. still will go up eventually, even in that scenario, just not as quickly, uh, but... How much would you encourage automation for pH control when using a salt cell? Um, like I said, if you're balancing your water now with LSI, I mean, how frequently do you need to test for LSI? My opinion is once a month is sufficient because alkalinity and calcium hardness really doesn't fluctuate that much over time. No, but I think if somebody's on site, I mean, if you're balancing it with LSI, even with that, the pH is going to go up to about 8.4 seems to be where it lingers around right. the salt. Right. So if you're balancing it, then you'd have to balance it off of 8.4. Um, but we're, I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned with the once a week folks that are going out there. They have salt systems on these pools and they're adding two cups of acid each week or mm -hmm. however much it is. And they get to a point where they don't even know why they're adding it anymore because it doesn't seem to make a difference because next week when we come back out, it's high again. And there are things we can add to the water. We can establish a borate level. We know that it'll still be high, but it won't be as high when we come back out, which is a plus. I like to recommend um, automation just because realist, nobody's touching it until I touch it again next week. So I can't right. really count on the homeowner to come out and run any type of test whatsoever. And then even monitoring or utilizing the LSI. So you're suggesting go into the LSI, assume an 8.4 pH and balance it out that way. And then don't worry about it. I don't know. I, I would recommend get your, your pH to where you want it to, you okay. know, so you then, know, four, seven, six. So um, in that once a week scenario where nobody right. else is touching it, right. then autom automation is a viable option. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Anything that you can do to inject a little bit of acid, you know, I like a little slow pace acid injection instead of dumping it one time. Right. Um, exactly. Um, but what I've, I've noticed is that the more that you oversize a cell, um, it, it does not drift up into that 8.4 range. All right. Ever? Uh, right. Because theoretically, here, here's what I, all salt chlorine generator manufacturers get our blade material from the same company. Right. And it's the same company that originally made uh, chlorine generators in the United States, Diamond Shamrock, LTEC, right? Um, so LTEC makes blades for everyone. And their 
head of the engineering or engineering department that did chlorine generators for pool, um, he's always shown me in papers and spoke to me and said, theoretically, if we use all the chlorine that we're putting into the pool every day to maintain whatever level you want to maintain, your pH will not fluctuate. Okay. Because when you look at chlorine generation, you got, let's use a simple two blade design. Okay. Coming off the blade, you've got a high pH surface and a low pH surface, right? Because you've got chlorine gas coming off of one side, which is very low pH. The other side is going to be, you know, very alkaline. So that uh, theoretically, you've got balanced water conditions, right? The only time that that starts to drift up is because now you're making more chlorine because of high chlorine demand situations um, and, and bring in your chlorine level up. So the longer the cell stays on, the more it's impacting that pH to drift up. You know, I course, agree with that. Said, I, I do agree with that. The longer it stays, yeah. on, I just, um, interesting. Okay. All right. I can, I can go with you on that. Okay. So yeah, oversizing is always recommended. I always say sell the homeowner the biggest cell size cell that they can afford and they'll have fewer problems with pH uh, drifting up. Let me ask you another question pertaining to that same thing. If you go with an oversized cell, do phosphates become less of a concern? Um, how does phosphates factor in? If we look at um, why does a city add phosphates to the municipal water? They want to protect the pipes, right? Because phosphate coats the metal pipes, prevent it from corrosion. So when we've got phosphates in our pool water and starts getting too high, we know that it's, it's doing a couple of things. Um, it's feeding algae if there's algae present, right? Because it's an algae feed. The other thing that it's doing is it's got the, a higher potential to coat our blades. Mm -hmm. So when it coats the metal blades, it reduces the efficiency of a chlorine generation system. Okay, so that's where uh, phosphates come into play. Now, if I've got a larger cell, does it minimize the impact of phosphates? Not really, because the yeah. phosphate will coat all the blades that are inside of it, okay? Now, um, our co-pilot unit is ozone generation with our salt system, as you can see that we built in the venturi into the manifold. Now, I'm going to skip on this real quickly right now because with the fluidra and the CMP and the del ozone, um, we don't have a good source right now for the ozone generation box because we were getting, getting it from del ozone. All right, so with the whole transition, we have to wait that out and see exactly what takes place. But this application was perfect because we talked about minimizing how much the cell is on. This helps out quite a bit, and that stabilizes how much the pH drifts up also, something like this. All right. All right, so total control. Rody, you, you talked about automation. Now, with our total control system, We've got a couple of modes that we can put our total control system in. Purifier, which is just chlorine generation only, which is a power supply and a manifold. pH control mode, which we add the acid tank with our system. We've got a 15 gallon UV rated outdoor tank with a stenter pump on there. On the stenter pump, we actually use a number one tube on the inside of the circulation pump. Um, so it feeds the slowest volume of acid and water solution. In the tank, we're mixing a four to one ratio of, of acid and water. Um, but the nice thing with this system is where we inject the acid into the system is right in the manifold before the cell. I so absolutely can... love um, two things. One, I absolutely love this. And number two, um, I need you to get me a usable pic a picture of this that I can use on a okay. different, no, different level. Just didn't want to forget to tell you. All right, no problem. All right, so in the, yeah, the pH control mode on the power supply, we actually tell it um, the feed rate that we want to do. If we want to do five ounces per, per, per hour, per day, per week, we can adjust it to that amount of volume. And it's kind of like the percentage also. Um, not every pool is going to be a certain percentage. You've got 15,000 gallon pools side by side in the neighborhood. This one has dogs going into it. You know you're going to run at a higher output. Um, with the dogs running into it. So same thing with the pH. It all depends on what's impacting it. So you can adjust um, the feed rate until you're able to maintain the desired pH level with the pH control mode. Um, the third mode is total control. In the total control mode, we're adding a um, what we call the chemistry controller, which has um, the ORP and pH sensors in it. 
All right. So in purifier mode, it's just like the DIG 220 that I described before. It's just your power supply and your manifold assembly. In the pH control mode, we're asking the we're adding the acid tank, acid tank, and we're telling it how much acid to feed manually as well. In the total control mode, the SIM5001 is a pool chemistry controller, and that one is based on ORP reading and uh, pH set points, all right? Like I have on there, think of your AC thermostat. You set it, and it should feed acid automatically um, to maintain your desired pH level. It should feed chlorine automatically to maintain your desired ORP. Now, what I find is that a lot of homeowners get confused with ORP and parts per million of chlorine. So there's a little confusion there, but you know, once you have it operational, it is a lot easier to maintain a pool because it's all on automation. It feeds the chemicals on demand, all right? Um, when we get into our commercial models, this is what we call our pool pilot professional. With this design, we can build anywhere from two cells up to six cells in a single manifold. Likewise, in the power supply, you can see there's six power modules in there, but we can build it from two uh, power modules up to six power modules. Um, and it, expandable with this one, uh, we're using our NSF approved commercially rated um, cells that produce uh, a little over 2. Point, well, it makes 2.62 pounds per day per cell as tested by NSF. Okay, um, so with this system, we can we can put it on any size pool. If we have a very high demand pool, we can do multiple power, power supplies also. Um, these are compatible with ORP controllers. Um, we have a new model that's called a Pro uh, WC series, a water cooled series. Now, what's different between, let me go back to this one, which is the uh, multiple cell uh, manifold assembly. You can see that we've got a, a bunch of cells that stacked in series. Whereas when we look at the water cooled system, we've got a single cell with a very high output per cell. On the output, you can see we have an eight pound per day all the way up to 28 pounds per day out of a single cell. Okay, um, this is a completely sealed box. Um, so there's no really chance of any kind of chemical attack, uh, uh, you know, to corrode any of the um, components inside of the circuit board itself. So it's a very uh, long lasting control box, very rugged design um, that has very few parts. Now, the, the water cool portion of it is when you're running it with an ORP pH controller, we take some of that water sample line and run it through the power supply. And you can see on the bottom, we've got that titanium tubes to where we connect the water supply that's gonna run through there. And what that does is it hits that heat sink. So it keeps those circuit boards cool because we know that anytime that you can run a much cooler power supply, the longer the equipment's gonna last. So that's exactly what we're doing with these uh, water cooled lines going into the control box itself. On the cell design, we've got a, a number of different uh, configurations with the uh, number of blades on the inside dictating how much chlorine we can produce. On the two pic pictures in the middle on the right-hand side, the one on the right-hand side, you can see that there's a lot fewer blades. The one in the middle is gonna be our 28 pound per day cell, which has a lot of bl blades on the inside. The nice thing with this particular unit is it's a much more rugged um, looking system. It's got a true 15,000 hours of operating life from the cell. So you're going to get three plus years out of these cells if it's running 12 month seasons. Very small footprint, very low flow requirement. We're only looking at 20 gallons per minute flow going through there. So it's basically a side stream from your main circulation uh, water going up into the system. With this particular unit, we are looking at a little bit higher chlorine um, or salt level rather, 3,500 to 5,000 is the salt range that you wanna maintain. When you get up to the 5,000, you can make more chlorine um, running at the 5,000 than you can at the 3,500. Um, it's a self-cleaning cell also, and it's basically a constant uh, current power supply. So it's always feeding power to the cell um, to where your adjustments on the control dial basically dictates how much amperage or how much power is going to the cell. The more power, the more chlorine that you can generate. So when you lower the output, you're sending less power to the cell, which makes less chlorine, but also extends the life of the cell as well. 
All right, a couple of pictures of the installations of a single cell, dual cell, four cell and six cell system. As you can see that when you start getting into the larger number of cells, it's basically on a bypass configuration is how you would install it. Our biggest project to date, um, and I, I know there's, there's a lot of systems out there. It's like, well, it's not really good because you're just putting a whole bunch of cells in series. Well, I can tell you that with our particular unit, um, our commercial cells are commercially rated. It's not the same as our residential cells being put on a commercial pool. This is the JW Marriott uh, Desert Ridge in Scottsdale, Arizona. And every single body of water that they have that the, um, the guests use has our autopilot system on there. It's been on there for over 11 years um, of complete satisfaction. Bottom left side, there's a Lazy River, 320,000 gallons. Their challenge to us was every 4th of July holiday, we have about 1,500 guests that stay in that Lazy River. They've got drink service coming right to them, so they never get out. Um, by midday of the first day of, of the holiday, they cannot see the bottom of the, of the Lazy River. They said, tell me how many cells I need to make sure that I can still see the bottom on those heavy days. On that particular pool, that six cell pool pilot professional, I've got six of those, so 36 salt cells altogether, producing over 90 pounds per day of chlorine to maintain that pool. And like I said, they've been satisfied for over 10 years um, with that particular system. And like I said, the rest of the bodies also has multiple cell systems on those as well. That's All right, awesome. for commercial dealers, one of the things that you want to consider, especially, like I said, we were talking about um, bleach levels getting higher, trichlor tablet shortages, or prices getting higher also. With our, with our commercial systems, we've got a commercial lease and rental program. Our typical warranty for a commercial system is one year parts and labor. When we get into the rental, I'm gonna focus more on, on the rental program. When we get into the rental program, we cover the parts for the whole duration. And we'll offer either a three-year or four-year uh, rental program. What this does, instead of being a capital expenditure where a lot of commercial pools would then need to go to their board of directors, a homeowners association, and get an approval to purchase the equipment, our rental program allows that maintenance manager or the engineering department to submit it as a monthly budgetary item. It's much easier for them to get a budgeted monthly expense than trying to go through the approval process for capital expenditure. So it makes it really easy to spread out their payments. Now, what's nice is that they've got a fixed cost for the next three to four years for their chlorine needs for their pools, all right? And on that third bullet point, I said fixed cost for three to four years or longer. What happens at the end of the uh, first term is they can cancel it, they can extend it with the same equipment, same payment for another three or four years, and we cover the parts still, all right? So cell fails, we replace the cell, no problem. Power supply fails, we replace it, no problem. The majority of the rentals that I've got out there now do that third option, which is renew another contract where they've had all new equipment. So we're putting in a whole new manifold, a whole new power supply, new equipment, updated, software, whatever there is. Um, so that's a big benefit to them. And the reason why I can say that the second term would probably th be the same payment as a first term is because in the first term, what do you have? You've got electrical, you've got plumbing, you've got um, fittings, you've got everything that's involved with putting in new equipment. The second term, that's already there. You don't need to add it in. So even if, if I had a price increase, your cost would still be about the same and the monthly amount would be about the same to the end user, okay? Now, where does this program benefit the dealer? Is that whatever you quoted them for the, for the system installed, um, you basically pay for the equipment. You pay us for the equipment. We cut you a check for the difference between cost of the equipment and your quoted price to that end user. So you get paid up front. And then when that term finishes, you're brought back in to offer them another renewal on the contract. So you're brought back in all the time. So you're a part of the whole process itself. But like I said, it gives you an option to close on a, a sale for uh, these commercial properties by offering a budgetary item instead of a capital expenditures. Example calculations on a $5,000 project, it comes out to $168.50 a month for three years. So they've got a fixed budgeted item. A larger project that might cost $18,000, 588.60 for three years um, 
with, like I said, all parts are covered for that whole entire duration. All right, so think about that when you come across your next uh, commercial project where you know they're him and hawing about adding a salt system. We've got options to help you with that. Troubleshooting with all salt systems. Know your key components, whether it's a Hayward, a Pentair, Jandy, an autopilot system. You've got comp basic components. You've got a power supply, you've got a cell, and then you've got some form of a flow detection, all right? There are a couple of basic tests that you can do, and going through a process of, of el elimination will help you go through it uh, very quickly. I'm looking at my time. All right, so what to ask for resolving issues. If you call me, right, Sean, I'm going to go out to an autopilot job. I'm going to tell you, call me when you're at the job, because if you try to try those diagnose it now, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions, all right? So can you call me when you're standing in front of the unit? Are there any warning lights on the power supply? Most manufacturers will give you an idea of where to start looking based on warning lights, warning messages on the power supply. Is the cell clean of any kind of scale or debris? If you've got a dirty cell, that's the first thing that you want to do is to descale it and then figure out why it's scaling up. Like I said, go back to your saturation index and make sure your LSI is balanced water. Um, what is your salt level? If you're running low on salt, you're not going to create as much chlorine as, as you can. If you're too high, you, you may have to dilute it down. Do you have enough flow to the cell? All right, so those are your basic questions because you're thinking in your mind, oh, it's a nice clean installation from what they're answering, but then you get out there and you get a mess of something like this where it's like, man, and we've seen some of those pictures on the Facebook page as well. So always write, ask the right questions to get the right answers. Most calls can be handled over the phone. Most are not related to a defective component. You use your diagnostic lights and your messages to walk through the system. Most common issues, uh, scaled or failing cell. All right, so scaled cell is gonna hinder water flow and depletes the life of the cell. The worst condition for a cell, I, I've seen brand new cells with poor LSI scale up and not address for a couple of months, okay? And after about three or four months, that cell can pr could probably be worn out and depleted at that point if it's allowed to get scaled and continue to operate while it's scaled up. Low salt affects the chlorine production and the cell life. If you're operating under low salt conditions, the cell life will be affected by it. Um, with the amount of power that's going to the cell, a low salt condition will give you a higher voltage and lower amperage. With an autopilot system, um, I'll give you a, a, an error message that tells you um, check clean cell at that point and gives me an idea of what to check. Water temperatures, cold water decreases conductivity um, where the volts rise, amps drop also, but cold water temperature can also create issues. Um, basic understanding of water chemistry. This gets to where uh, we talk about the saturation index. Those parameters there, pH, alkalinity, calcium hardness, and water temperature are the factors for LSI. A cyanuric acid for an outdoor pool is very important. So when we're dealing with a pool that does not have automation with ORP, because we know ORP, you don't want to go over 50 parts per million of stabilizer because that affects your ORP reading. But for a typical residential pool, especially in the Sun Belt states where it gets very hot, a lot of sunlight, I'd like 75 parts per million of cyanuric acid, okay? Because even with the higher um, cyanuric acid levels, it does help protect the chlorine in the water from the exposure to sunlight. Okay, but saturation index, I can't emphasize how much that that's important because the, my, maintaining balanced water conditions can greatly um, extend the life of the cell and prevent any kind of scale formation. Here's the equation for the saturation index. Now we know that that 12.1 is affected by your TDS. So when we start factoring that into there, that 12.1 does change um, a few points on it. Um, I like to look at the old saturation index of plus or minus 0.3. Um, I know the scale forming site is now 0.5, but I like to keep it tighter because in regards to the cell, again, the scale is the worst condition to let it operate under. I'm not so smart. I don't take any charts around like this around with me. So I'd rather use either Taylor Watergram or there's a lot of apps online that you can download on your phone, but all it takes is testing those few other parameters and plugging the numbers in to see what your saturation index is. I highly recommend at least once a month checking your LSI. 
Here's a lightly scaled cell, no problems. Reverse polarity will probably descale it. Here's one that's scaled off, uh, scaled up between the blades where it's bridging. Acid washing will clean it up and get it back into operation. This is something that's greatly neglected. Um, something that's running like this. Um, shame on either the pool operator or the homeowner to let it get to this condition. They've um, greatly depleted much of the cell life if they let it run in this condition. Okay. Once we get in that condition, how do we acid wash the cell? As you see in the bottom left corner, the picture of our diagram, we can take the whole upper end of the manifold, flip it upside down, and put our acid water solution inside there. Okay. Um, lean it up against a tree, get it off the patio pavers or any of the decks. It, you don't want any of the bubbling acid solution coming off and affecting um, any of their stone. Um, but basically add your acid and water solution in there, let it sit for about 20 minutes, um, see if it's finished uh, bubbling up, dump your acid water solution safely, either out in a field or into the pool itself, because obviously if it's scaling up, they probably have high pH in the pool. If it's still scaled up, soak it again, all right? But this is one of the things that we can do to acid wash the cell. And that big red, red line on the bottom, do not use anything metallic into the cell because anytime that you scrape the cell with anything metallic, you can compromise the life of the cell, all right? Uh, troubleshooting, we've got a check system, system light, and I'll wrap it up, Rudy. Check system light and a couple of messages that walk you into what the problems are. I wanted to get into a little more of the things that we hear that's more of a critical condition in regards to salt systems, all right? When we get into low chlorine challenges, we gotta be careful when we're doing any kind of these specialty algae treatment that contains yellow, yellow mustard algae, algae any of those things that contain sodium bromide will greatly affect a chlorine generation system because sodium bromide is bromine salt. It requires chlorine to activate the bromine. So what are we doing with the chlorine generator? We're generating chlorine, which will constantly go towards reacting with the sodium bromide. And now what happens is you don't have enough chlorine to keep the pool um, safely sanitize and keep the algae out, and that becomes a problem. The other thing is sodium thiosulfate, normally seen in commercial pools. If you put too much of that, that will become a, a, a big problem. Um, phosphates we talked about, nitrates we talked about, uh, low stabilizer level. If you don't have enough stabilizer, the sun can eat up the chlorine just as quickly as, being, as it's being produced. Output setting, make sure you adjust it properly. Um, short pump run times, uh, make sure that you're circulating enough water and the chlorine generator is operating um, with sufficient flow. If you've got variable speed, you can't just run it at low speed if it's not activating the flow switch to turn the system on. So make sure those speeds are adjusted. And again, if the cell is too small, you're not going to make enough chlorine generation. Electrolysis, there are a bunch of sacrificial anodes. Sacrificial anodes are a band-aid to the problem. The problem is you've got some kind of stray voltage going in there. Make sure your equipment is bonded proper, properly, okay? This is just an indicator to let you know that you've got stray voltage. Bring an electrician in there and correct those stray voltage issues. High pH we talked about, upsize the system. Calcium or salt, if you wet it and it dissolves, it's salt. If it does not dissolve, it's calcium. Um, deck coping, especially with uh, you know, the stone, is it due to salt or is it due to chlorine? Well, rinse off your deck area on a regular basis. Seal your deck if you need to. And if you're using bleach, sodium hypochlorite adds salt to the pool also. In Florida, we've got tons of pools that's on bleach. If you test the salt, you'll see that they're already at 2,500, 3,000 parts per million of salt. It's funny, but nobody ever thinks that. So deck coping, you'll see a lot of degradation based on water splashing out. Sealing it, you can see where it doesn't allow it to penetrate. A lot of scenarios where stone can be very porous and, and you know salt water can damage those. But if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you've got a cementitious deck that's got an erosion pattern also. But when you pull back and see what that's from, it's coming from the rain gutter. So our rain can deteriorate our stone also. It's not always because of salt, all right? So that, that's basically, Rudy, thank you for the time again. Oh, uh, thank you, Sean. I definitely appreciate having you. So let me, um, available nationwide, your product? Absolutely. Um, okay. Outside of Florida, we do a lot of dealer direct sales. Um, in certain markets, we are um, handling it through distribution. Um, but very select uh, markets. 
um, with our whole goods in regards to Autopilot and AquaCal, we do have price protection on the internet. We do have map uh, pricing enforcement. Um, if there are any whole goods online that fall below our map pricing, we will enforce it. Um, we do not have map on uh, replacement cells, okay? And I know that's a sticky point, but re the replacement cell market um, has been greatly eroded because of the counterfeit cells and the, you know, the, the uh, imported cells to where they bring down the value of the cell market, you know. Um, unfortunately, we get a lot of homers to buy the, the, um, the replacement cells from some other manufacturer and they find out they're not as good, you know. But now they're looking at, well, it only cost me $50 less than what yours cost. I'm going to go with the cheaper one instead. So that's the reason why we don't enforce uh, any kind of map pricing on replacement cells. But on the whole goods, absolutely, we'll, re we'll uh, enforce map pricing. So anybody wants to get a hold of Sean, he's got his information up here on the screen. You can call him on his cell or send him an email. If he's anything like me, email probably usually works a little bit better. Um, <laughs> I'm usually involved in something. But everybody, I want to say thank you. Uh, thank you again, Sean, for um, spending some time here with us. I definitely appreciate that. Um, and, uh, you know, it was definitely great talking with you on a couple of different subjects. And I do appreciate you sharing with everybody that's watching and uh, coming and hanging out with me off and on throughout the day. And for everybody else, I am you know, we started this whole virtual um, trade show thing May 2nd of last year. We were just inside of the pandemic and it was a time when we really were in a market that was, well, we were in a situation that was extremely unpredictable and we wanted to create some sense of normalcy. So hopefully, um, you know, I know we're in a different situation now. Hopefully everybody got a chance to check out some of the great vendors who were willing to come here and chat with us today. And if you didn't get a chance to see it while it was going on, definitely, you know, watch, I guess this is the tail end of it. So you've seen it later. It's been recorded. It's online. So you won't get this message until it's over. But I wanted to thank, again, Rob Estelle from exam, the exam pros, Sean Assam from AquaCal talking about heat pumps, and then also the AquaPilot salt systems. It's actually, sorry, Sean Assam with uh, Team Horner talking about AquaCal and AquaPilot systems. I wanted to thank Alicia Stevens and Tom Paragini. I wanted to thank David Penton and Lauren Stack. I wanted to, uh, Lisa, sorry that you were not able to attend with us. I think I jumped in there and filled in nicely on a totally different subject that had nothing to do with pool route sales. Gus, thank you. Patrick Smith with SR Smith. Steve Jones with Fluidra, also Misty Knight, you were in there as well. And, uh, you know, everybody, despite what's going on right now in the market with chlorine, with equipment and all of that stuff, um, we will make it through it. We always do. Uh, just, uh, you know, do your best and keep in touch with one another. If you have questions, reach out. That's what the groups are about. It's all about working together and learning together. And enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this um, break from the norm in our virtual trade show. Thank you again. And if anybody wants to reach me, you know where to find me. I'll be on Facebook somewhere. Thank you.